Well, good morning. Second day of the feast. Again, I'm incredibly excited to be here. It was great to stand up here and lead songs yesterday, the voices that come back. Um, I, on, the, on the Sabbath now, it's, uh, uh, a lot of times it's just me singing, and that's pretty ugly. So it's nice to hear all these voices that come back. I have a question for you today. And it's a question that I think about a lot, mostly because of the line of work that I'm in. But I'm blown away at how much this applies to everything. So I'll ask you that question. And that question starts out fairly innocent. It says, are you anonymous? This is a feast message. So my question to you today is, are you anonymous? Before World War II, during the meteoric rise of Adolf Hitler to his power, a majority of the German people simply wanted to not be a part of the things going on around them. They were very quiet, very passive. They were just quiet. And the reason they were that way was because they really didn't want to get involved. There wasn't a lot that they wanted to do. They had their own lives to rebuild after World War I their own families to support. They had been steadily and handily defeated in World War I. And they had their own agendas to further. They had their families to take care of. They had many things to reassemble in their life. They really didn't want a part of this new rise, this crazy radical guy that was doing some pretty insane things off to the side. They preferred to be one of the unnamed masses they preferred that rather than rise up and stick their heads up above the fray. You know, it's kind of like the above the water. You really want your head up there when somebody's shooting. Right? Common and quiet, preferably anonymous, was the order of the day. By the time the Nazi party began to be a big influence in the German economy, and I mean the economy, right? The war machine had started. They had started producing weapons of war. They had started getting the economy going. They had really started things growing. Before it became a big influence on the German military, or before they knew it, it began to be a big influence on the German military. It controlled the way that the military operated. They had changed all the procedures for operating in war. They had rewritten the books. Germany was, and all the Germans that lived there, were subtly influenced by the relatively new political party. The Nazi party in some shape or form had existed long before that, but being organized and being completely centralized and being polarized had not been something that party had ever experienced. The majority of the German people, their desire was to not stick out, to not be different, so they would not be singled out that had seemingly overnight been transferred, transformed into believing and accepting the new norm. This is okay. This is good for the country. Look, I've got work again. I'm working a full week. I have a paycheck. I had all the things that are important. But they had overnight been transformed into believing and accepting this norm, the new and better direction for the country, the change. The younger generation had begun to see a new and better Germany. They had grown up, I can't imagine being a child, 9, 10, 12 years old in the First World War in a country that had been soundly defeated right, and put in its place. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be a young child. But that young generation saw a new and better Germ Germany. The Nazi party had begun to influence and quote unquote persuade the educators and the school students that their parents' ways were not the correct ways of the new Germany. They were not the way that things should be. Before you knew it, the country was aligned behind one of the most brutal dictators of our time and our memory. Those that were anonymous had, in Joseph Stalin's words, and repeatedly used by Hitler, 
those that were anonymous, had become the silent part of the mass of, quote, in the book, Mein Kampf, useful idiots. There's a reason they were labeled useful idiots. Because some of them that they could polarize by pushing them one direction to the left or one direction to the right, so they met in the middle, like this, they could use and they could play against each other. And they knew that. They were very, very smart. Those were useful idiots because they didn't understand what they were doing, but boy, they gave them purpose and they gave them emotional response and they gave them opinions that they felt mattered. Anybody been on Twitter or Facebook lately? Opinions that they thought mattered. I heard a uh, radio personality I was listening to this last week. He said, I hate to break it to you, you younger generation. I hate to break this to you. He said, but when you post something on Facebook and you post something on Twitter and you post something on whatever you choose, you blog, you do whatever, it is your opinion. And your opinion doesn't matter. He said, I know that's not going to make me popular. I know I'm probably going to get a million people turning the radio off right now, but it doesn't matter. Your opinion is worthless. And I thought that was kind of a, a stark statement to make, but I thought about it and I started reading these blogs that I could, I go to technical blogs every day and I read them because there's specific articles about new technology. Sometimes I read about uh, diabetes, I've had that all my life, and I was reading a, uh, a blog about there's a researcher at Harvard working with the British government has come up with a way to rapidly grow islet cells, rapidly like millions of them in a very, very short period of time, which has been very difficult in the past. It looks like a cure because they can inject it and three to six months later, it's still producing insulin and responding the way that the body should for type 1 diabetics, right? Very promising, right? But then I read the opinions at the end of it. And someone says, what about for type 2 diabetics? And the next response is, what part of this article didn't you read, dumb fill in the blanks, right? And then it just goes downhill from there. It spirals. The next six, seven comments are all angry, boom, boom, opposition, right? Useful idiots. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, right? But people are being played. They're being put in a position. They're being polarized. Doesn't matter whether you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian. I don't care. You're being polarized. You're being pushed into a corner so you come out swinging. A very small percentage of the German people decided that this was not the true Germany. This was not the true German way of life. And they defected to other countries. Read about it. There were a lot that came to the U.S. because they didn't want to live under this. They didn't think this was right. Today, we have a different political leadership attempting to overtake the countries around the world. Ed spoke of it in great detail yesterday. It operates under the guise of, quote, a peaceful religion. It is protected by political leaders. Foundational laws are being rewritten. Constitutional laws are being rewritten to incorporate tolerance for the agenda and their political ways of governing. And there again is a huge group of silent quote, useful idiots, close quote, sitting on the sidelines saying it'll be okay. Tolerance is a good thing. We need more tolerance. And yet they've perverted the meaning of the word tolerance. But tolerance, it's a good thing. They're shaking their heads in disbelief and hoping that if they keep their heads under the radar that it won't affect them. If I'm just tolerant, nobody will bother me. I'll be quiet, I'll sit over here in my house, nobody will bother me. But it is bothering everyone. It is a problem for all of us. Right? I'm not here for any purpose for a political speech, but it is interesting to see over time the way that we repeat as human beings what we have done over and over again. It's like it's like the definition of insanity that Albert Einstein 
quoted. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for different results. Right? That's insanity. But we as a nation, we as a people in this whole world, it's not just the U.S. Ed pointed that out. His articles and the things he read were not just from the U.S. papers. It's happening everywhere. And it doesn't matter whether it's Islam or it's Buddhism or it's whatever, it's Christ mainstream Christianity. It's all happening and it's all incorrect. Right? Exodus 12, verse 43. I'm, going to, I'm leading up to Exodus 12, verse 49, because this is, this is key for all of us. So let's read just a little bit of the backstory and what the, what the, uh, what's being written about here. Exodus 12, verse 43 is where I'm going to start. I'm going to read down to 50, and it says, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. So he's establishing, he's saying, the Passover. This is how the writings, this is how it should be done. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, thou shalt eat, that then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Now we know now that circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign, a physical sign of the acceptance, and now circumcision of the heart is what's required for Christ's Passover. Right? But let's look at the next verse, verse 49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn. One law. Another word for homeborn is native, right? A native individual, somebody that knows. It's rooted in them. They grew up there. It's uh, sprung from, right? And unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. So let me ask you something now. Does tolerance apply in God's laws? How good is tolerance? Because it says here that one law and we know what law that is, shall be to him that is homeborn, that is native, one law. And it says, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded, Moses and Aaron, so did they. So one law. And it doesn't say, and it'll be okay if you keep your law, and somebody else that's in your house decides that they want to keep Christmas. Now, I'm not, believe me, I'm not going into the, you've got two people in a family and one believes in the truth and one believes in modern Christianity. I'm not going into that at all. But I'm saying that one says you're going to keep it and the other one says, oh, no, not only am I not going to keep that, but I'm going to prevent you from doing it. That's not what God says. He says there's one law, keep it. Would you say that any country in this world who has let people from around the world who bring in their tradition and their customs, their religions and their politics still keeps one law that is homeborn? I could probably show you lots of history books that prove otherwise, that never prove that people that let everyone in, that let them keep their own traditions and customs, their own languages, their own everything, will ever survive. I can show you that over and over again, not only from the Bible, but from history books. Both, both will show you that. In every society that has ever existed, when an influx of immigrants comes into that country, those immigrants quickly feel that they should have the right, the right to have their traditions, their politics, 
their political views, their opinions, their religious practices, influence, and write laws for the country that they have invaded, that they have come into. Maybe they've been invited. I thought it was funny that invaded and invited both started with the same set of letters. Maybe that's just coincidence. But after all, they have rights, don't they? They should be treated equally. They should be allowed to do whatever they want on your soil, right? And the people of the country remain anonymous. Online, you can read about how the, middle, the Midwesterners are not really happy with what's going on right now. You can read that. You certainly get that impression just by looking around the internet and reading the articles and reading the things that are going on and reading how many people jump on those people that say, oh no, we should all be live and let live and we should absolutely let everybody worship their own God. And people are just going after them. There's a tide that's turned, but the problem is, is it's this tide, right? Because they don't know the truth. So did the children of Israel in the Old Testament remain anonymous? And anonymous is kind of a funny word because anonymous is simply the art of being silent, the art of being quiet, the art of being meek the, and getting in the corner and being away. But it's not the same meekness as humility. It's avoidance. That's what anonymous truly means. Anonymous means, no way, not me. Uh-uh. Don't put me there. Nope, I wasn't with him. It wasn't me. You must be mistaken. That's the first definition of, an, of anonymity for me, being anonymous. Right? So, did they adopt the traditions of the people, those, those children of Israel, the traditions of the people of the lands they conquered? Or did they teach those people the ways of God through their example, words, and deeds? Which way did it happen? And I can't believe that they came out of Egypt and within what appears to be a few days, they were already back to making, making idols. Moses goes up on the mountain and they are making golden idols. That didn't take long at all. So they adopted. This is what the Bible says about either the people who either have the world and its ills enter into them or have to come out of its life. Right? So there's two ways, and I found this, I found this amazing because I looked up one word as I, was, as I was reading scriptures. I looked up one word that I saw in one of the scriptures I was reading in Acts. And that word only appears twice in the Bible. And there's two different uses for it, right? So let's turn to Acts 16, verse 16. Acts 16, verse 16, and I'll read up through 18, so I'll give you a minute to catch up. And it says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So here was someone that, and I, I, remember, I remember many years ago reading this scripture, and I thought, well, wait a minute, how could she have divination, which is divine, and soothsaying in the same sentence? Didn't seem to make any sense, but I've learned a little bit more since then. Acts 16, verse 17, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us, the way of salvation. So she knew who they were. I don't know if that was her talking or it was the spirit of divination in her that was talking, but I'm sure that spirit was trying to get out and I don't know what was going on in that woman. And in verse 18 it says, And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Come out of her is the phrase that I saw. And I thought, I know I've seen that before. Come out of her, right? But here's a situation where there's a spirit coming out of this woman because they said it had to. Paul said, get out. And it got, right? 
Revelation 18.4 has a little bit different twist on the exact same phrase. It says, in Revelation 18.4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Right? That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So there's two phrase, two uses of the phrase come out of her. There's one that says, get that spirit out of that individual. There's another that says, people come out, be, get away from it. That you're not a part of the plagues. Right? There's a promise right there from God. That ye, may, that ye receive not of her plagues. So come out of her is, is saying to us, that phrase itself says to us, you need to get out of whatever that anonymity is. You need to get out of that way of life because anonymity is not just being silent or being quiet or hiding in a corner and trying to avoid something. It becomes a way of life. It becomes a method of I will do anything to protect myself and make sure that nothing happens to the life that I've built right here in the middle. Right? I'll make sure the German people were going to make sure that they just looked the other way when all this stuff was going on because they didn't want any of that to be an influence. But think about, think about the parallel to life that that is. Right? Initially, Hitler was some crazy man off in the corner doing crazy things. Eventually, a majority of the German people thought, wow, this guy really got our economy going. He's really kick-starting that. I have a lot of pride in Germany again. This is where I want to be. That anonymity is dangerous. Right? So let's look at part two of anonymity. I'm going to show you a little bit different aspect of it. Part two of anonymity, anon yeah, I knew I'd do that eventually. Anonymity is this. Edward Snowden. Does anybody not know that name? Has anybody not heard that name in the last two years? Edward Snowden? Right? Edward Snowden is a new household name. A short while ago, the world's newspapers revealed in the news sources that a man had, that had worked at the National Security Agency, the NSA, was leaking to the world information about exactly what was being collected, what information was being gathered and put together. Over the past two years, he has revealed more and more about the practices that the agency has used to illegally record and transcribe every phone call, instant message, text, computer interaction that has taken place in the last 10 plus years. Now, I know we all think about that, and we, we don't think about exactly the depth to which that is. I work in this industry. I'm not in the security industry, but I work here. I am an analyst that works with analytical software. A correlation analyst is, is the official way that they look at it. And I'll tell you why that's important in just a second. The NSA has come out and they've said, don't worry about it. We're not really listening into your calls. They are just, they're just tracking the metadata. Let me make that clear to you. You know what metadata is? Yeah, I'm sure you don't. But metadata is the information that describes all the things about the data. Things like who you call, who calls you, when you call them, how many times you call them, how long the call is. So they don't really record the conversation. It's just about who you called and everything about that call. Oh, yeah, and by the way, they came out and they said, we're, we're recording the words, but the computer only highlights key words, things like kill, shoot, Bible, fertilizer, IRS. Those are some of the key words that they're going to track. So those are some of the things that, you know, we're just looking at that because we want to prevent terrorist attacks, right? So they deem these potentially dangerous, and they flag them for further review. Now, then they have a second level of computer that looks at that and looks through all that information, right? But don't worry. They're not listening. They're not listening to your conversation. Besides, it's helped 
them stop many countless, countless terror attacks on our soil. So it's really okay. Just be anonymous. Just be quiet. It'll be okay. Just relax. Now, I'll tell you this story. I don't want to panic you, but uh, uh, there's a couple of things I'll tell you about everything that you own. All right? I'll tell that, and I'll do it by, by telling you a story about what happened to a large retail chain with a big red and white target on it. I won't mention their name, though. Just the, the, <clears throat> yeah, the picture. Um, they were, and actually this is public news, so it won't really matter. Um, Target was, uh, there was a huge article a number of years ago. I don't remember how long ago anyways, but I remember reading it and following it initially because I was fascinated by the ability to do these things. A father called in to Target and to their customer service and said, I don't know what your problem is but stop sending my 14-year-old daughter coupons for diapers, coupons for formula, and, and, how to, and discounts off baby beds and stuff. I don't know what you people think you're doing trying to talk my daughter into getting pregnant, but not, and he, I'm being nice. I've read the transcript. It was 20 minutes of him railing them for sending these coupons. Four days later, he called back and he said, I have to call and talk to you. I have to apologize to you. He says, I went to my 14-year-old daughter stewing and she broke down crying and told me she was pregnant. How did you know? Well, you'd think the obvious. Well, she probably went in there and bought some baby beds. She probably went in there. Nothing of the sort happened. She bought a different kind of soap. She bought different types of body scrub. She bought different types of things and knickknacks and things in Target. And based on the algorithms that they have and the understanding they have of analytics, they could predict with 90 plus percent accuracy that she was probably pregnant. So they started sending coupons. Now, we can all think about that and we can think, oh no, big brother, right? And there's some, I gotta tell you, there's. There's some in that that I look at. And at first, I thought it was the neatest thing ever because I work in this industry. And I thought, wow, how can they do all that? Then I thought better of it after a little while. Correlation analytics is the science of being able to relate one piece of data to another with a high level of accuracy. To be able to look at Twitter, your frequency card data, you know, you go into your Kroger or your Safeway or your whatever the name of the grocery store is, and you, you have them do that, there's a reason that they're having you do that. Not only do they send you coupons, they make big money selling that information about your profile, the type of buyer you are, and the groups of buyers that they have together. They make big money on that data. That's why they all do it. That's why your speedy rewards cards work the way it does. Right? But they correlate this data. They look at things, your Facebook account, Google searches on your computer, uh, Google search on, that you do on a computer at the library. And one of my favorite, your movie rentals at Redbox, your bank account transactions. Your, and one of, the, one of my favorites is, did you ever notice now lately when you go and you shop, they say, and, and you pay cash, they say, can you give me your zip code? Anybody ever ask you that? I get a kick out of my wife says, no, and the clerk looks at her like funny, like why not? Well, the reason is, is that with your zip code, they can accurately predict within a 5% margin exactly who you are based on what you buy. So these are all things that the computer age has brought us. And again, it should be something that's really good for us and we really want, and we really want them to give us you know, 50% off exactly what we need to buy. But when you stop and you think about that, there's two sides to it, right? I'm not, I'm not doing a conspiracy theory here, but this is what I do for a living. I understand this stuff. Now, I don't do the correlation for grocery stores and things like that, but I work with companies that do. Um, even if you live in the hills of West Virginia, if you've ever used a debit card or saved money at a bank or given a store clerk your zip code, 
They know who you are. Right? Google is a data company. Don't for a minute think that Google is a products company. I know they make some smartphones. I know they've got um, hardware that they sell. I know that they have a search engine, but they collect so much data you can't even imagine. I could tell you that it's 33 petaflops of data. You have no concept of how much that is. No concept how much data that is and how much they take in every day. They use that data and they sell it. They sell it to TV companies, etc. Right. TV services that they sell, everything. It's incredibly valuable. I don't know how many, how many people ever heard or remember the TiVo story. My TiVo thinks I'm gay. Does anybody remember that? When the DVR first came out and you're recording programs and it's the coolest thing since sliced bread, right? You're recording it on your DVR. You don't have to have a VHS tape anymore and slip it in there. You put your TiVo on, you set it, you tell it what time to record or what series of shows you want, kind of like your DVR you get with the cable company. And what TiVo did initially was they put a software in there that could predict the kind of things you'd want to watch. And I remember reading this article after it first came out, and it, the article was titled, My TiVo Thinks I'm Gay. Because apparently this person had watched some cooking shows and they had watched a couple other shows. I think it was Will and Grace at the time, which was uh, uh, apparently there were a couple of homosexuals in that. They were very, very flaming and very out. So the TiVo naturally assumed they were gay and started suggesting show after show after show about the gay lifestyle. So how anonymous are you? So there's my second, my second perspective. How anonymous are you? I'm not telling you to go cut all your credit cards up and cut all your debit cards up and get out of the bank. Yeah, there's there's a, a certain level that you have, to, you have to use today, right? But how anonymous are you? And that's just an example of what people know about you. What are you known for? What do people know about you? What would all the information about your life that they have tell about the story of your life? How interesting would it be? Oh, he bought a, a $1 unsweet iced tea last Tuesday at McDonald's. Right? How interesting is that? Well, then 10 minutes later, he bought fertilizer at Farm and Fleet. And then a half hour later, he went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of wire. Hmm. All of a sudden, I'm on a list and somebody's watching me, right? But yeah, so uh, I'm, and I, I'm actually making this up on the fly because in my head, I connect all this stuff. I do this all the time, right? But, uh, and, and, but don't be surprised. That really does go on. Those are the kind of things that go on. It's all done automated. It happens within moments, right? Um, that's the kind of stuff that goes on. But what would it tell about your life? How about, ugh. They went to that Bible store again and bought another book. Right? They bought a book on how to manage your finances. They bought, you know, what would it tell about you? They paid their bills. Oh, those jerks, they paid their bills on time again. Oh, uh, sorry, those are the kind, but what story do you want that to tell about you? So as much as you'd like to be anonymous, as much as the German people wanted to be anonymous, not only did everything around them influence them to change who they were and how they worked, but in our day and age, it's not just about the things that are around us, right? Satan has done an incredible job because 70 years ago, 80 years ago, all the Germans had were, was radio and word of mouth. That's what they had to get their message around. There was no TV, no internet, no cell phones, no anything, right? And so they had to make sure that when they spoke, they spoke a consistent message and man, it was invigorating and it was, it hit on all the buttons, vanity, pride, greed, made sure it hit all of them. Right? Nowadays, there's information everywhere and not an ounce of knowledge. There are more opinions on the internet today than there are actually today, I read a statistic, it was about a month ago, that back then, a month ago, there were more opinions on the internet than there was fact by a four to one margin. So what does that say about what the internet has provided us? 
All right, so I'm going to set up a little bit of an exercise here, and I'll have you, I'll have you work on this before, uh, before the end of the service here. Um, I want you to, from this side of the room, I want you to, you can say it out loud, or you can think it in your head, I want you to go left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, as you work your way across each row. And just remember whether you're left or right. It's important to remember that. I'm going to use that later. All right? There's a reason for that. It has nothing to do with politics. I'm not asking whether you're left or right or which side you're going to stand on. Uh, so just go left, right, left, right, and think about that in your head and remember that whether you're left or right later. So what does God say about being anonymous? Right? I know what the Germans said about it. I know what it says about what's supposed to happen back in the Old Testament. But what does God say about being anonymous? Well, James 1.27 starts to give us the first definition. James 1.27, very clear. It says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Unspotted. I have really been perplexed about that word for a long time. Does this mean that we need to be kept, we need to be quiet, keep in our houses, separate ourselves physically and mentally from all that is around us in the world? What does it mean to be unspotted from the world? What is the definition of that phrase? Because physically and mentally, I could go live, you know, what happens, let me, let me put it this way, what happens when someone becomes a hermit? But uh, what was his name, Ted Kaczynski? What was the guy that was some Unabomber or something like that? He was a hermit. He was about 22 miles out in the woods someplace, and he had his cabin, and he had it all set up, right? What about, have you seen it on the evening news, where the neighbor says, I don't know what happened. They've always been pretty much kept to themselves. We've never had any interaction with them. How long have they lived here? 22 years. Sorry, I don't mean the, the Western the, the accent. There's no intention there at all. But I just think it's hysterical when they say, you know, they, I'm thinking, oh, two months. Well, no, 22 years? You've got to be kidding me. People have lived there and you don't know them? Um, they lived in a cabin in the deep woods. Uh, there's a, there's a, a program on that I watched about 10 minutes of called Wild Alaska. And it's about this family that is just, Oh, it just makes the worst backwoods I've ever seen in my life look like a cakewalk, like a walk in the park. Wild Alaska is about this, uh, this family that lives, they're squatters and they live in Alaska. And they are interesting, let's just put it that way, interesting. But we have a mental vision of people that are hermits or they're they truly physically remove themselves from the world. Is that what God intends? Is that what God intends? Because most religious related physical signs are outward. Right? We're, talking about, we're talking about true religion here, right? But most religious signs are very outward. They're outward show. They say, see how religious I am? Look at how religious I am. I wear a suit every week. Sorry. I follow the Ten Commandments. You ever heard that? I follow. It's I. Right? You can tell because I have them in my house. But do they? Do they really have the Ten Commandments in their house? Do they follow them? How can you tell? Is it because they've got a plaque that says the Ten Commandments in their house? Do they have the Ten Commandments in their house? Do they have a plaque of the Ten Commandments in their house? What's the difference? What's the difference between common Christianity and us? What's the difference? What should be the difference, right? Do they have stone tablets in their front yard? Is it on their local courthouse? 
because it's not so much that they don't want the Ten Commandments on their buildings. It's that they don't want the Ten Commandments in their buildings. They don't want the people in their buildings to have the Ten Commandments. They don't want the people around their buildings, the employees. They don't want them to have the Ten Commandments. It has nothing to do with those stone tablets carved into the wall on the outside of the building. Does it make them religious because there's Bible verses posted throughout their house? Because there's a cross hanging from their rearview mirror? Or maybe a, you know, that, that bobble-headed Mary right, on the dashboard? Right? <clears throat> I said, I don't care if it rains or freezes, as long as I got my plastic Jesus stuck there in the dashboard of my car. I remember that song. Uh, a bumper sticker that says, I follow Christ, or my boss is a Jewish carpenter. I don't know about you, but what those say to me is, I got to make sure I never get stuck in an elevator with these people. Right? Uh, those are outward signs. They're not a way of life. Those are anonymous signs. First right? Samuel 16, verse 7. First Samuel 16, verse 7. In First Samuel 16, God is speaking to Samuel, asking him uh, how long he's going to lament about not having Saul as the king. I think I, uh, I think I wrote that down right. He is lamenting and it, that it's a failure on his part. Oh, how could this not happen, etc., etc. But in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. What are we looking at? What are we building? Are we building a collection of plaques? Are we building a collection of the coolest looking Ten Commandments we can find in the trinket store? Right? I have been in people's houses that they must have 40 copies of the Ten Commandments in every single on wood, on brass, on copper, in scrolls, on the wall. I've seen it everywhere. And again, it's one of those things where I get in there and I'm like, ah, get me out of here. <clears throat> so the Bible makes it clear. God is far more interested in the heart of a man than he is in the outward appearance. If it is how he chooses his leaders. Leaders. A whole room full of them right here at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's how he chooses his leaders how he recognizes those that are dedicated to him, that have made changes in their life, that are overcoming for him to do the right things. Jeremiah 10, verse 2. Jeremiah 10, verse 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. I often quote this to my friend in Cleveland, who I talk about a lot, who absolutely tells me that all that old stuff is just so done away with. Those are the handwriting of ordinances. You've got to get rid of them. It's okay to put a tree in your house. I read him the next, I start reading the next verse, and he goes, hey, I've got to go. I've, uh, somebody just came into the store. Right? Every, time I, every time he does this with me. So let me ask you a question. Did you guys go out and see the blood moon? Did you see that full moon? That, I got to tell you, it was amazing. It was very cool, but it was not significant. It was just something incredible about God's country. Let me tell you about God's country. I'll step off, go off in a little bit of a different tangent here for a moment. Tell you about God's country. I just drove my daughter from Cincinnati out to Bend, Oregon. We got in the car. We drove for 35 hours in three days. Right. First day, we made it to Denver, Colorado. And we, we left, and it was, you know, Indiana, Illinois, and man, it was boring. We got to Iowa, 
And it started to get a little more interesting because there were a little bit of the foothills uh, from some of the mountains there. And then we got into uh, Kansas. We had to drive all the way across Kansas. Now, Kansas is 457 miles of barely rolling fields of wheat. And it's really cool for about the first 30 miles. <laughs> and then every mile takes four and a half minutes from that point forward. Uh, but so you, we got, but we did have interesting things happen, right? We talk about pestilence. Maybe you don't know about this. They're having a real problem with grasshoppers out in Kansas and all the fields and, and what's going on. They're ravenous. And I was reading about it because I couldn't figure out what it was. We were driving. It had just gotten dusk and we were driving and we were being pummeled like rain with something. And we got out of the car about an hour later, and it was awful. Oh, it was awful. There was stuff squished on every square inch of that car. Windshield, everything else. We were stopping to scrub the windshield off. And it turns out that there's supposed to be about three grasshoppers per square yard in, in the fields out there. And that's what the normal population is. But because there hasn't been enough rain, and it wasn't cold enough the last couple of years, that population has grown to 15 per square yard. A five-time, a five-fold increase. That is amazing. And let me tell you, when you're driving through them, it is not pretty. Right? We had no idea what these were, but they were even big marks on the windshield. Not tiny marks, big ones. And they were long, some of them long marks. No, I won't, I won't, you can ask me later for the details. So, but we drove across the country, and then we got into, I got into a little bit of Utah that was in the dark. We got into Idaho, um, and we stayed in Twin Falls. Uh, we stayed in Twin Falls, and I drove over this bridge, and I looked at the GPS, and I'm like, oh, we're going over a river. We're going over the Snake River. How cool. Well, we got down there, and we stayed in the hotel. We got up the next morning. I drove back over. It was a 200-foot gorge in the middle of nothing but flatlands in the desert. And believe it or not, at 4,200 feet in the air, there's desert. 4,200 foot plains. Some of the most, if you ever get the chance to drive across the country, do it. This, it, what it is amazing is, as annoying as Kansas was, God created it in one day. 457 miles of beautiful rolling plains that are fertile soil. Absolutely astounding beautiful, incredible mountains in the desert that are black with iron ore. Red streaks in them, absolutely stunning with sand running down between them. Just stuff you can't, you can't paint. It reminds me of the Etch-a-Sketch you used to turn around, right, and trying to make things happen. Amazing. So are these significant signs, right? Are those grasshoppers, are the blood moons significant? A heavenly sign that has Benny Hinn, oh man, he is bursting with prophecy over this. Man, he is going to make $50 million this year. Talking about his prophecy about that, blood moons. Ah, man, hogwash. So let's look at the other extreme. Isaiah 58, verse 1. Because this has always been something that people have come back at me with, right? They've said, well, it says, you know, it says in Isaiah 51, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Right? Doesn't this say that I should be warning the people? How can we be, put, how can we be quiet have a, and have a voice like a trumpet? Well, there's another question about your anonymity. So how can you be quiet and have a voice like a trumpet? If you're anonymous, you're quiet. You're keeping your head below the water, right? You're keeping out of the middle of things. Right? The key word here is I. Who is supposed to warn the people? Whose job is it? Who did God put in place to warn the people? Right? Ezekiel 33, verse 1. Ezekiel 33, verse 1, I'm going to lead up to a couple of scriptures here, so I'm going to read 1 through 7. But Ezekiel 33, verse 1, it says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, So God is talking to Ezekiel. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man 
of their coasts and set him for their watchman. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. So who is it that he's saying needs to be set there? A watchman. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But the blood will I require of the watchman's hand. I have heard more people in my 13 years in the church talk about how they just can't wait to be a minister. I have talked to every minister that's ever become one, and they've said, I can't believe I did this. <laughs> I can't believe I did this, because this is a full-time job. I liken it to this, right? When you're young and you're thinking about having a child, right? I think one of the things you don't realize is that the moment that that child is born, you are on the hook 365, 24, 7, right? For the rest of your life. Doesn't matter whether they move out or not, you still care. Things change over time, but that's the responsibility. That's the scope of the responsibility that you have. Think about the ministers. Those are the watchmen. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? Right? So it is the responsibility of the watchman, not the congregation. Those who, through a process of conversion and commitment through their lives, who are appointed by God by the laying on of hands to the position of the watchman. The scripture makes me wonder why so many people can't wait to be ministers. Can you imagine the cacophony if everyone in the church was a minister? Oh, man, we would be here all day listening to sermons. It's bad enough you're here an hour with me. Who we are to be is, is described very, very clearly in Scripture. So let's turn. I'll give you a couple of these. I'm going to read more than I give you. But uh, if you want to write them down, Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and thy light unto my path. John 12, verse 46 says, I am come a light into the world, but whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. John 12, 36 says, While ye have light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Luke 8 verse 16 says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. What is our responsibility? Right? Are we a light? John 12, 46. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Matthew 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So you are at the Feast of Tabernacles. It is not just a physical act. You didn't just save a little money so you could be here, so you could drive a long way and get here. You didn't reserve a hotel room. You didn't just do the physical acts. It's not just a mental act. It's not just the physical act. It is a spiritual act of being here. It's acceptance. It's humility. It's knowing that in spite of what this world says about us, against us, we must do the right things. 
We must be a light. Now, a light doesn't speak much, but a light shines. There are 255 references in the, in the King James Version to the word light. And with the exception of about a dozen of them where the word is translated differently, they all mean lights like jewels. They all have a, the ability to say, we are part of the light. Right? So an anonymous, if you were going to be anonymous, and this is one of the things I, I laugh, and this is one of the things I was thinking about, I've always wanted to get a backup generator. It's just because I'm such a computer nerd. I've got a dozen of them in my house and all this stuff that goes on in my house. I've got backup batteries everywhere and all these things. My wife says to me, she says, uh, why, if the power goes out for two weeks, do you want to be the only house in 20 miles that has lights on? Right? Um, and I... <laughs> So I, I stop and I think about that as I'm saying this. It just came to mind. But uh, um, you want to be a light. You want to be by your actions. Remember how I said, what would your story, what would your data tell about you? What would that data talk about, about you? What would it say about you? What point is it going to make? And what are people, after they read the story, going to say? And they're going to say, wow, that's a light? That's somebody that I'd want to be near? Or are they going to say, I hope I'm never on an elevator with them? All right. what's, the, what's the answer there? All right. I'll give it to you in a minute. I was, going to, I was going to tell you what your assignment is, but I'll give it to you in just a minute. May God light your path during the feast. May he be the guide that you need during this feast with your interactions with everyone, with your ability to meet new friends, to find new people, to talk about new things, to have great discussions, to reinforce, charge your batteries. May God be a light under your feet during this feast. Three scriptures I'm going to leave you with, and then I'll give you your assignment. Luke 11, verse 36. It says, If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Revelation 21, 23 says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Can you imagine the day where we don't need the sun? Right? Because God is everything that we need. That's what we're here for. That's what we're imagining this week. That's what we're living in. Let's make it that way. Revelation 22, 5. Then I'll give you your assignment. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I encourage every single one of you to not be anonymous. Don't cover the light, right? You don't have to stand on the street corner because the Bible clearly says that's an outward sign. But it does say, be a light, that all people know after they've met you, huh, there was something different about them. All right, so your assignment is this. I told you to do the left and the right. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to go ahead and stand up for just a moment. And I'd like you to turn either to the left or the right, depending on what you were given. And I'd like you to talk to that person about either how great it is to be at the feast or why you're happy that they're here.